Welcome to the Child and Adult Care Food Program at Risk After School 101 Annual Training. If you have any questions during this training, please reach out to me at the email address on the screen. Let's get started. First, I'll be discussing the legislation that was passed in 2019 called LD 577. For those of you watching the recording, if this legislation does not apply to your district or your district is an experienced CACFP sponsor, you may skip ahead in this presentation to slide number 12, titled CACFP Meal Pattern. So what is LD 577? LD 577 is titled An Act to Increase Access to Nutritious Foods in Schools by Implementing an After-School Food Program for At-Risk Students. The public law is available to view online at the link on your screen. The law states, beginning with the 2020 school year, a school administrative unit with at least one public school in which at least 50% of students qualified for a free or reduced price lunch during the preceding school year shall participate in the Federal Child and Adult Care Food Program. How do I know if my school district meets the 50% or more criteria? In anticipation of this question, Maine DOE Child Nutrition annually creates a report titled LD 577 Report by District. This report shows all the schools and districts that fall under the requirements of LD 577 for that school year. The LD 577 Status Report is located on the CACFP at risk webpage. The link to the at risk webpage is available on your screen. Please check the full report to see if any of your district schools are listed. What do we need to serve for CACFP at risk after school? The typical meals are snack with two meal components and supper with five meal components. Supper can be in unitized containers or served through a normal lunch line. It can be hot or cold, which is a great way to use unserved items from lunch. Schools can also use offer versus serve. Offer five components and students must take at least three components. The reimbursement rate for each supper meal served is $4.73. $4.43 plus 30 cents cash in lieu of commodities. Reimbursement rates are updated every July and the rates on your screen are effective July 1, 2024 through June 30th, 2025. Please reach out to me by email if you have any questions about the current reimbursement rates. Districts who operate CACFP at risk can serve on snow days, school vacations, and weekends. Districts can even serve breakfast and lunch on those days with prior approval. It's important to know that snack or supper can be served as soon as the school day ends. For example, ABC school dismissal bell rings at 2.30 p.m. An ABC school can serve supper at 2.30 p.m. A requirement of the program is participants need to eat their meal on site. I will be discussing any waivers currently in place shortly on slide number 14. If my district meets the requirements of the law for CACFP at risk after school, but our district is already serving snacks through the after school snack service program, do we need to do anything? Yes, the district needs to either participate in the CACFP at-risk after-school program or opt out using the guidance from LD 577. Our district or school does not offer an after-school enrichment activity. What are we required to do? An after-school education enrichment activity that is open to all is a requirement to participate in CACFP at risk after school. If a district or school does not provide education enrichment activities, the district or school does not qualify for CACFP at risk and must opt out using the guidance from LD 577 or start an enrichment program. What does open to all mean? 
education enrichment activities that do not limit membership for reasons other than space or security or where applicable licensing requirements. So this means the football or basketball team, any sports teams would not qualify as enrichment because it's not open to everyone every day. Examples of open to all enrichment activities are homework help, garden club, Lego club, etc. How does my district opt out? By law, a school administrative unit that is required to operate a federal child and adult care food program may choose not to operate such a program if it determines by a vote of the governing body of a school administrative unit after notice and a public hearing that operating such a program would be financially or logistically impractical. This could be a school board meeting, which allows a public hearing prior to the voting. After our district holds the public hearing and the board votes, do I need to report the results to the Maine Department of Education? Yes, an online LD577 opt-out form is created annually. This form requires information regarding the date of notice, the date of the public hearing, and the date and results of the school board vote. The form also asks why the sponsor or district decided not to operate the CACFP at-risk program. Under LD 577, when do schools have to have their public hearing by? Is there a deadline or a timeline? Child Nutrition annually posts a list of qualifying schools that fall under LD 577 for that school year. The notice, public hearing, and school board vote needs to be completed sometime within that qualifying school year. To recap, the qualifying district can start or opt out anytime during the qualifying school year. So a district that may want to pilot the CACFP at-risk program and serve supper may want to start the program in the spring and try it out for a few months to see how it goes. What is the process for starting the program? First, watch the CACFP 101 webinar online at www.mean.gov slash DOE slash schools slash nutrition slash CACFP slash at risk. Then take the at risk 101 quiz. Next, go to www.mean.gov slash DOE slash schools slash nutrition slash claims and under the access and permissions complete the CMP web agreement revision form to add the CACFP to your current agreement with the state agency. Complete the CACFP user request form to update and add user permissions to CACFP agreement. When completing the CMP Web CACFP user request form, please keep in mind there should be two people trained in all aspects of CACFP and the claim will need to be processed and approved by two different users, the sponsor administrator and a claim approver. Attach the forms to an email and send to child.nutrition at main.gov. In the body of the email, please make sure to include the district's federal ID number. Next, the CMP web administrator will send you an email when the user and or CACFP access has been granted. Complete the CACFP online agreement through CMP web. The last step is the agreement approval. Once the agreement has been approved, the districts may claim meals from the beginning of the month in which the agreement is approved. The agreement approval process can vary based on the number of corrections needed once it has been submitted to the state agency. The CACFP team is great about processing the agreements as quickly as possible. If you have any questions about what you just heard or need more clarification, we recognize that each district and school is unique, so please reach out to us. We want to help. Now we are going to dig into the basics about CACFP at risk.
Please know all CACFP training documents are located on our webpage or by using the link on your screen. All CACFP at-risk training materials are sent out annually. When your agreement is approved or upon completion of the agreement renewal. First, we are going to talk about the CACFP meal pattern. At risk programs can operate outside regular school hours. This includes holidays and vacations. At risk sites can serve up to one meal and one snack per child per day. Vacation example. ABC School serves breakfast and AM snack during school vacation weeks. Next, we're going to review the USDA waivers. These waivers are intended to provide needed flexibility to support at-risk after-school centers in continuing to offer nutritious meals during unanticipated school closures and are in effect through June 30, 2025. Unanticipated school building closures could be caused by natural disasters, unscheduled major building repairs, court orders relating to school safety or other issues, labor and management disputes, or when approved by the state agency for a similar unanticipated cause. However, Maine Department of Education may not approve a waiver for a local program operator for more than 10 consecutive operating days without approval from FNS. Under the non-congregate meal service, the waiver waives the requirements to serve meals through the CACFP at-risk after-school component in a congregate setting. Under the meal service times, the waiver waives the requirements that set meal time parameters for CACFP at-risk after-school centers. And under the parent and guardian meal pickup, the waiver waives the requirements that CACFP at-risk after-school meals may only be served directly to children. This includes putting in place processes to ensure that meals are distributed only to parents or guardians of eligible children and that duplicate meals are not distributed to any child. Under the enrichment activity, the waiver waives the requirements that require educational or enrichment activities for the at-risk component of CACFP. To request the use of these waivers, districts need to complete the Unanticipated School Closure Remote Learning Request Form. This is the CACFP meal pattern. In CACFP at-risk, you can serve any child age 18 years and younger. It's important to know that you would serve participants between the ages of 13 and 18, the same serving sizes as the six to 12 age group. These are minimum serving sizes, and we certainly encourage your districts to serve more to the older kids, as they may need more. Breakfast may be served on school vacations, weekends, and holidays if the education enrichment activity is offered. The breakfast meal pattern is made up of three food components. The first is fluid milk. The second is a fruit or vegetable or combination. At breakfast, fruits and veggies are treated as a single component. So for breakfast, districts can choose to serve a vegetable, a fruit, or a combination of both. And the third component is a grain food. If you wish, at breakfast, you may replace the grain component with a meat, meat alternate item up to three times per week. Parents may provide one nutritional equivalent component per day and the district can still claim the meal for reimbursement. An important thing to remember is there are no vegetable subgroup requirements in the CACFP meal pattern. Districts can choose to follow the CACFP meal pattern or the National School Lunch Program meal pattern. The vegetable subgroups would be required for districts utilizing the National School Lunch Program meal pattern. Meat and meat alternate at breakfast. CACFP meal pattern includes flexibility to serve meat and meat alternates in a reimbursable breakfast. 
Schools may substitute the entire grains component with a meat or meat alternate at breakfast a maximum of three times per week. Yogurt must contain no more than 23 grams of sugar per six ounces. This handout available on our webpage can provide you with more tips and information about replacing the grain with a meat, meat alternate item at breakfast. USDA has a great handout regarding serving milk in the CACFP program. It has a lot of great information and is a quick guide for serving milk to all ages in CACFP. On the back page, it gives you space to practice identifying the correct milk for the different age groups. Diet Modification Forms Very similar to the National School Lunch Program, CACFP sites must provide reasonable modifications to meals and snacks or to the meal service itself to accommodate participants with disabilities. These modifications are done on a case-by-case -case basis. If the meal modification required does not meet the meal pattern requirements, then a medical statement from a licensed physician or licensed healthcare professional who is authorized to write medical prescriptions under state law must be provided. Meals that do not meet the CACFP meal pattern requirements are not eligible for reimbursement unless they are supported by a medical statement. The medical statement should include a description of the child's disability so that you understand how it restricts the child's diet. The statement should also describe what must be done to accommodate the disability. This may include what foods should not be served and recommendations for what should be served. A medical statement is required to justify reimbursement for the modified meal. This statement should be kept on file at the site or where the food is prepared. If the parent provides a note signed by a doctor, then you must provide the substitution. You may always choose to accommodate a non-disability related special dietary need that is not supported by a medical statement if the modification requested can be made within the meal pattern requirement. An example of this would be if a parent told you that their child cannot eat strawberries. Strawberries can be easily replaced by another fruit to meet the meal pattern requirement. Modified meals that meet the meal pattern requirement are reimbursable without a written medical statement. However, you should have a note from the parent on file so that we know why the child is receiving something different from everyone else and there is no appearance of any discrimination. If you already have a form completed for the school nutrition program, you can use the school nutrition program form for CACFP. Non-dairy beverages may be served to participants with medical or other special dietary needs. Non-dairy products that do not meet eligibility requirements may only be claimed if there is a documented disability and the product is specifically listed on the diet modification form, which is signed by a state licensed healthcare professional. Non-dairy beverages must be nutritionally equivalent to cow's milk and meet the nutritional standards listed in the manual. Non-dairy beverages may be any fat level and must be unflavored for children under age six. As you'll remember, fluid milk is its own component in the CACFP. So if you cannot serve fluid cow's milk, then you need to either find a beverage that's nutritionally equivalent to cow's milk, or you'll need a note from the, a state licensed healthcare professional if you want to receive reimbursement. The following milk substitutes do not require a diet modification form. Remember, if the parent or guardian has a medical note from a state licensed healthcare professional, then you must provide the food substitute. However, you may run into a situation where a parent or guardian 
requests a substitute, but the child does not have a disability and they do not have a medical note from a state licensed healthcare professional. It's definitely good customer service to provide the requested substitute if at all possible. If not, remember that parents can still bring in one meal component and you can still claim the meal if you provide all of the other food. Regardless of whether you're providing the substitute or the parents are, have the parent fill out the diet modification form and keep it on file to prevent any appearance of discrimination. The meal containing the substitute will be reimbursed if the substitute is nutritionally equivalent to the original component and meets the meal pattern requirements and the diet modification form is on file. For example, a family might be vegetarian and want their child to receive a non-dairy beverage. It would be good customer service to purchase the non-dairy beverage if you can. Have the family fill out the diet modification form to request that their child receive a non-dairy beverage. Then refer to the list of milk substitutes mentioned in the last slide. If the non-dairy beverage that they are requesting is listed on the chart, it is nutritionally equivalent to cow's milk, so it meets meal pattern requirements and you can serve it and receive reimbursement with just the parent's note on file. If the parents insist on a non-dairy beverage that is not listed on the chart, then it is not nutritionally equivalent to cow's milk and you cannot receive reimbursement for meals and snacks containing the substitute until you get a note from a state licensed healthcare professional. 100% fruit or vegetable juice is credible in the CACFP as either a fruit or vegetable, depending on what it's made of. But you are only allowed to serve juice one time per day. This is due to juice lacking dietary fiber and other nutrients. Vegetables and fruits that are blended and served as a smoothie are considered to be juice and are included in the restriction of juice being served no more than once each day. The once per day juice restriction applies to the site, not to the individual child. So juice cannot be served at PM snack and supper even if the snacks are being served to two distinctly different groups of children. If juice is being served at two different supper shifts to two distinctly different groups of children, it can be served to both shifts because only one meal service contains juice. The meal pattern for kids for lunch and supper is made up of all five meal components. Unlike breakfast, fruits and vegetables are considered different meal components at lunch. There are a few rules around serving fruits and vegetables at mealtime. Pureed fruits and vegetables used as part of a meal item, such as pureed carrots in a sauce used for macaroni and cheese, can count as a credible vegetable as long as the dish also contains at least one eighth cup of a recognizable vegetable per serving. Two servings of different beans, peas, and lentils can count as a vegetable and as a meat alternate in the same meal if they are in separate dishes. For example, chickpeas may be served as part of a salad as a vegetable component, and pinto beans may be served as part of a chili as a meat alternate component. A full serving of the lentils included in each dish must be served to each child in order to claim both a vegetable and a meat alternate component. At lunch and supper, you have the flexibility to replace the fruit component with a second vegetable if it's a different vegetable from the one you're already going to serve. This is because most children already eat enough fruit. Allowing two vegetables at lunch and supper increases exposure to a wider variety of vegetables. Vegetables do credit towards the meal pattern based on volume. Kind of the opposite of dried fruit, raw leafy greens credit at half the volume, 
So for example, one cup of raw spinach leaves would credit as one half cup vegetables. And in the CACFP, we credit tomatoes and avocados as vegetables. So you'll want to keep that in mind when you plan your menu. Here's an example. The lunch and supper meal pattern for children 6 to 18 years of age requires minimum serving sizes of a half cup serving of vegetables and a quarter cup serving of fruit. Therefore, the serving size of the second vegetable served in place of the fruit component at lunch or supper for this age group must be at least one quarter cup. And remember to offer two different vegetables. If you offered a half a cup of cooked carrots and a quarter cup raw baby carrots, then the meal would not meet the meal pattern and you would not be eligible to receive reimbursement for the meal. So in the example above, a supper with a serving of red peppers and a serving of carrots, both of which are in the red and orange vegetable subgroup, would be allowable. Schools may not serve two fruits at lunch or supper. Food items that are a mix of vegetables and fruit, such as a carrot raisin salad, can credit towards both the vegetable and fruit component at lunch and supper if each component is easily recognizable and each serving contains at least the minimum reimbursable serving size of a 1 8 cup of carrots and 1 8 cup of raisins. A child 6 to 12 years of age would need to receive a half cup of carrots and an 8 cup of raisins in a serving to have the carrot raisin salad credit as the entire vegetable and the entire fruit component. Now you may have noticed that I said one eighth cup of raisins rather than a quarter cup of fruit mentioned in the meal pattern. That's because dried fruit credits a little differently. Dried fruits credit towards the meal pattern at twice the volume of fresh fruit. So a quarter cup of dried raisins credits as a half a cup of fruit. Another rule around serving fruits is that home canned fruits are not allowed due to the risk of botulism, but freezing your own fruit is okay. Just like vegetable and fruit mixtures, serving two vegetables as part of a vegetable mixture can also credit toward the entire fruit and vegetable component. If you can recognize each vegetable and each serving contains at least that minimum 1 8 cup serving size. Also, home canned vegetables are not allowed due to the risk of botulism, but like fruits, freezing your own veggies is okay. If you buy pre-mixed vegetable mixtures like the one on the screen, it is allowed and credited as a single vegetable because you don't know how much of each vegetable is actually in the mixture. At snack time, you can serve any two of the five meal components as long as only one of the components is a beverage. It's best practice to include a fruit or vegetable as one of your snack components to encourage healthy eating. The grain component includes foods like bread, cereals, crackers, rolls, muffins, and tortillas. Major things that you need to remember about grains in CACFP include that most sweetened grains are not allowed in CACFP, and that one grain item served each day must be whole grain rich. Here are some common grain-based desserts, granola bars, cinnamon rolls, whole grain donuts, or any type of cereal or fruit bar. These items are not allowable in CACFP and should not be served as part of the meal pattern. It is also important to know CACFP reimbursement cannot be used to purchase grain-based desserts. USDA has created this great list that breaks down what is a grain-based dessert and what is not a grain-based dessert. This is a great visual reminder for your kitchen staff. On the CACFP resources webpage, we have a section dedicated specifically to ounce equivalent resources, including the measuring chart we just discussed. 
the Feeding Infants Using Ounce Equivalents Guide, Calculating Ounce Equivalents in Recipes, and Crediting Single Serving Packages of Grain. My amazing coworker April has created and recorded a wonderful ounce equivalents webinar that takes you step by step through the process of determining ounce equivalents in CACFP. This webinar link is available on the resources webpage, and I also put the link on this slide. With CACFP, one grain component served per day must be whole grain rich. If you plan to serve only one meal or snack per day in your program, the grain served at that meal must be whole grain rich. On this slide is a resource created by the National CACFP Sponsors Association. This handout shows you how to correctly identify a whole grain rich food item using the rule of three and other methods. This resource is available on our website. In CACFP, you are required to post a dated menu for parents and children to see the wonderful food you're serving. Production records are not required for CACFP, so your menu must state all the components that you are serving specifically. Generic statements like fruit or vegetable should be updated to the actual item offered before the day of meal service. Cereals and yogurt should specifically list the types served since there are sugar limits on those items in CACFP. The types of milk offered should be clearly represented on the menu. Here you can see this district is offering 1% white or skim chocolate milk with each meal. Another menu requirement is that you identify which daily item is whole grain or whole grain rich. You cannot write a statement on the menu that says that one grain per day is whole grain rich. You'll need to identify specific items each day with the words whole grain or the letters WG or WGR. Please be aware potato chips and veggie straws are not credible items in the food program. Also, breakfast cereals served must contain no more than six grams of sugar per dry ounce. Breakfast cereals include ready-to-eat cereals, instant, and hot cereals. How do I determine if a breakfast cereal is within the sugar limit? One way to determine if your cereal meets the CACFP sugar limits is to use the main special supplemental nutrition program for women, infants, and children approved breakfast cereal list. All cereals on the WIC list meet CACFP sugar limits. You can also use the USDA's team nutrition training worksheet. The third method you can use is the nutrition facts label on your breakfast cereal packaging to calculate the sugar content per dry ounce. How do I determine if a yogurt is within the sugar limit? You can use the USDA's team nutrition training worksheet. And you can also use the nutrition facts label on the yogurt packaging to calculate the sugar content. At-risk sites must offer all five components at supper, and a child may decline to take one or two of the components. Mixed component items containing three or more components may not be declined. A meal component is one of the food groups that comprise a reimbursable meal. A food item is a specific food offered within a food component like turkey on whole grain bread is a food item that contains two food components. Also, offer versus served is not allowed for snacks. USDA has this handout available for more information on how to implement offer versus serve. There may be times when you want to serve a homemade or pre-made combination food or mixed dish. These are foods in which a single serving of the food item contains two or more of the required food components. Common examples of combination foods are pizza, shepherd's pie, chef's salads, and a hamburger on a bun with lettuce and tomatoes. To document how these foods credit towards the meal pattern, 
Keep either a standardized recipe or documentation from the food manufacturer on file. We will ask to see these documents during administrative reviews. A CN label statement clearly identifies the contribution of a product towards the meal pattern requirements. It protects child nutrition program operators from exaggerated claims about a product. A CN label provides a warranty against audit claims if the CN label product is used according to the manufacturer's directions. During an administrative review, the CACFP team will be asking to see copies of CN labels for items listed on the menu. There are a couple of great resources available for helping you determine if and how a food item credits towards the meal pattern. One of these items is USDA's Food Buying Guide. The Food Buying Guide is available online and includes many different features to help you determine if items are credible and helps you determine how much food to buy. Another resource is USDA's newly updated Crediting Handbook for the CACFP. This is a great resource for learning about the meal pattern and determining if foods are credible or not. Now I'm going to talk about record keeping in the CACFP. Record keeping is a very significant part of CACFP. Keeping accurate, complete CACFP records proves that you're eligible to receive this reimbursement. You'll hear us say a lot, if we can't see proof, we have to say it didn't happen. There are a lot of different types of records that you need to keep for CACFP. Today I'm going to go over what records you need to keep on file and where. Please try to keep your records well organized. It will save all of us time and energy when we review your program. You can keep your records digitally or, or on paper. We'll be asking you to upload documents in the CMP Web e-review system prior to the date of the on-site visit, and we'll also look at other documents on site. According to regulations, you must keep all CACFP records for three years plus the current year, so four years total. If your institution is going through an audit, certainly keep your records until the audit is closed. And if your institution has a policy to keep them longer, of course, that is fine as well. The current and past year's documentation must be kept on site. The other two years can be kept off site if you don't have enough space to keep all four years on site. We give you all the different records, forms, and information that you'll need for your daily CACFP operations. CACFP sends out CACFP at risk documentation once your agreement is approved or renewed. Most of the resources are also at the very top of the resources page on our main DOE CACFP website so that you can access them anytime that you need them. If the forms that we created for daily operations do not work well for your particular program, you are welcome to create your own as long as they capture all of the needed information. It will be helpful if you organize the majority of your program paperwork by month. When we audit your program, we will request to see all of your program paperwork for a specific month of operation. So having it already organized by month will be really helpful. Most school districts are now familiar with CMP Web. When you participate in CACFP, you are required to complete an agreement in CMP Web. This is an example of a CACFP agreement. In an effort to streamline the application process, school districts are not required to complete the budget or management plan portion of the agreement. The online agreement tells the state how and where your district plans to operate the at-risk program. We consider the agreement in CMP Web a living document because you can make changes to it throughout the year with state agency approval. It's a great reference to make sure you are claiming the correct number of sites and participants and correct meals. Once you've completed one online agreement in CMP Web, most of the information will roll over into the following year. The district will be required to submit an agreement every year. Now I'm going to go through some of the specific record keeping requirements for different CACFP records. 
The first is the non-discrimination statement. The non-discrimination statement is required for all program materials that are distributed to the public that mention USDA or CACFP. USDA is very particular about the non-discrimination statement. You must use the exact wording of the statement and be careful about font size. There are two non-discrimination statements, the full one and the short one. This is the full non-discrimination statement. As you can see, it's pretty long and works well in bigger publications like Program Handbook. This is the short statement. Prior approval for using the short statement is required for everything except menus. There are different record keeping requirements for different types of documentation. These are records that must be made available for public view. We will check when we review your program. Please reach out to CACFP for a poster if needed. These are examples of unitized meals from the Portland Public Schools. Chicken Caesar salad, make your own pizza, and a cracker stacker. Portland uses a CACFP meal pattern. Sanford schools have utilized their mascot to brand their supper meals. Spartan Super Snacks. They have created stickers that go on the unitized meal containers to show off their brand. Along with posting the menu in public view, the Spartan Super Snacks menu is posted daily in the announcements. This is a great way to promote your program during school. Meals are delivered to sites in Cambro containers to keep meals at the correct temperature. At-risk service is different for every school in every district. Some use carts, some use the normal lunch line. Find a way that works best for your students and your staff. The meal service can be in the cafeteria or served from a cart. The kids can eat in the cafeteria, the classroom, on the sports field, the library, anywhere, as long as it's on site. Under typical program rules, participants can only take one component off site such as a grain, fruit, or vegetable. The supper cart picture on the slide is from a school district in LA. In order to participate in CACFP, you are required to train your CACFP staff on seven specific CACFP topics annually. Trainings that you or your staff receive outside of your organization do not count towards this requirement. You need to train your staff on exactly how to perform CACFP duties in your program. So outside trainings don't count. Some topics relate to all staff. Some topics only relate to staff with relevant duty. You are required to keep documentation of these trainings. We can't just take your word for it. Again, you'll hear us say, if we can't see it, we have to say that it didn't happen. We do have a form available to help you track staff training. It's in the list of forms that I mentioned earlier. The form lists all of the required training topics and it has places to record the date and location of the training as well as places for trainers and attendees to sign in. Train on topics related to the staff member's CACFP duties. For example, you don't need to train someone on how to take point of service meal counts if they only file the claim. We have a form available to help you track staff training, which includes the required training topics. If you are working with an outside entity to provide the enrichment after school, and they are the individuals responsible for meal counts and attendance, they need training. It may be in the district's best interest to have site staff responsible for these duties sign a statement that they understand the training and requirements of the CACFP program. There are seven required training topics that you must train your staff on annually. When we review your program, we'll ask to see your training documentation for all seven of the required topics for all applicable staff. Civil rights is the first required training topic. Everyone having anything to do with CACFP needs civil rights training. 
We do have a civil rights presentation on our website that you can use for your in-house civil rights training because civil rights procedures are the same for everyone. This is the only outside training that you can use for your in-house training. These are the other six required training topics. Please remember, I'm talking about in-house training, not trainings you receive from us at the state or elsewhere. For each of these six topics, you will annually train staff with related duties on how you meet these program requirements within your organization. You will train your staff on your organization's procedures for meeting these requirements. We can't help you with these trainings because we don't know exactly how you do things in your organization. For example, in some programs, point of service meal counts are taken by teachers. In other programs, the cook may be in charge of the point of service meal count. Every program is a little bit different. So you need to train your staff on your specific procedures. We touched on it briefly earlier, but it's imperative that you keep any doctor notes or parental requests on file regarding food substitutions. If the food substitution results in you not meeting the meal pattern, you must have a doctor's note on file if you plan to claim the meal or snack. If it's a parental request and you can still meet the meal pattern with the food to be substituted, keeping these notes prevents any appearance of discrimination if a child is not eating the same food as everyone else. We will ask about these notes when we review your program. You also need to keep point of service meal count records. Point of service means that you're taking these counts of meals served immediately before, during, or immediately after meal service. Most CACFP programs require meal counts to be taken per child at point of service. Some programs have a sheet of paper with a list of kids' names and columns for each meal and snack. They make a check mark next to each child's name when they're served each meal or snack. We included a sample meal count form in the list of forms on our website that I mentioned earlier. You're welcome to use this meal count form or you can create your own as long as it captures all of the needed information. Some businesses purchase computer software that captures their meal count. Either method is acceptable. At-risk after-school programs may take consolidated meal counts which are just a total count of meals served rather than doing it by children's names. Attendance records are another CACFP requirement. Attendance must capture the individual's first and last name. Just to be clear, this is attendance at the meal, not attendance at the enrichment program. Meal count should never be higher than attendance so attendance records make a great edit check to ensure that you are not over claiming meals and snacks. Build in an edit check when compiling meal counts and attendance for the claim. USDA likes to see two sets of eyes on program paperwork to ensure accuracy whenever possible. Some districts are using their point of service keypad system as attendance, as it links to the child's name in a tick sheet similar to the ones in summer for the meal count. All districts currently operating the program do it differently. Do what works best for your school. Accountability is key. Districts cannot claim more meals than participants in attendance. This is something that needs to be discussed when partnering with outside organizations. The district is responsible if numbers are not correct. This meal count form is available on our website. It gives space for participants' first and last names, a check mark for attendance, and a check mark for the meal. Again, all at-risk sites meet these requirements differently. Do what works best for your site. Monitoring and five-day reconciliations are required for institutions with more than one site to ensure program integrity. This form is available on our website, but it's also sent out annually to at-risk sites upon agreement, approval, and renewal. 
Monitoring multiple sites. The district is required to review each site three times per year. Two of the three visits must be unannounced. At least one unannounced visit must include meal service observation and new sites must be monitored within the first four weeks of operation. We also provide monitoring forms which outline everything you need to observe and record. Make sure to vary meal services observed. If you are serving suppers, evening snacks, or serving meals on weekends, make sure to observe those as well. Please make sure to complete the five-day reconciliation form at each monitoring site. And if you start a new site, the site must be visited within the first four weeks of operation. Five-day reconciliation. The purpose is to reconcile meal counts to attendance. The five-day reconciliation is performed at every monitoring visit. It determines if meal counts are reasonable. It highlights discrepancies in meal counts and attendance, and it ensures that license capacity is being followed. This process allows us to look at a week's worth of attendance and meal counts to make sure things look okay. This document is also available on our webpage. Annual racial and ethnic data collection is used to determine how effectively FNS programs are reaching potential eligible persons and beneficiaries. Programs operating CACFP are required to collect racial and ethnic data for each site under its sponsorship each year. Schools that sponsor at-risk sites can use the race and ethnic data that is collected for the school in which the at-risk program is operating. Districts that collect meal benefit applications should make every effort to help parents understand the reason for the data collection and encourage them to complete the race and ethnicity portions of the form. If the sponsor or district cannot attain race and ethnic data through meal benefit applications, the following process on the slide should be used to collect annual racial and ethnic data. The sponsor must retain racial and ethnic data for three years, plus the current year, and must safeguard this information to prevent its use for discriminatory purposes. Access to program records containing racial and ethnic data should be kept confidential and limited to authorized personnel. When filing a claim, it's important to remember that each claim applies to a single calendar month. For example, February 1st through February 28th. Even if that month ends in the middle of the week, make sure your other supporting documents reflect that as well. At-risk after-school programs receive the free rate of reimbursement for all meals and snacks served. CIL stands for cash in lieu. This is extra reimbursement money that you will receive for every lunch and supper served that meets the meal pattern. So for every free lunch and supper you serve, you'll get $4.73 in reimbursement. This is a screenshot of the site claim for a for-profit child care center in our online claiming system. We've had a lot of folks tell us that they really like this new claiming system. This is the information that you'll be entering each month for each of your sites. At-risk programs enter the number of kids that participated in the month in the free section as they get the free rate of reimbursement for all participants. You'll enter the number of days you operated, that's the number of days that you were open for enrichment and fed kids at least one meal or snack through CACFP. Then you'll enter your total monthly attendance, which I'll explain in the next slide. Next, you'll enter your total meal counts for the month. There are a couple more steps involved in submitting your claim for payment but we have directions for filing claims in the new system and we are here for assistance when you need it. As I mentioned, you will be required to report your total monthly attendance in our online claim filing system. This is how you calculate your total monthly attendance. 
At the end of each day, using the attendance roster, you'll count the number of unique kids that attended and ate at least one meal or snack. At the end of the month, you'll add up all of the daily totals to calculate your total monthly attendance. The payment system has edit checks in place to ensure that we are paying you based upon what you're approved for in your agreement. If you try to claim more than what's in your approved agreement, the system will give you an error message, and the system will not pay a claim that has errors. When you claim, you cannot claim for more kids than you've reported as being enrolled in your program. Since you're an open site, this is the best guess you've made regarding the maximum amount of kids you could serve at one time. If your program has the potential to serve more kids than your best guess, say there's an event happening at the school during the same time as your CACFP at-risk supper time, make sure you increase that amount for the month you plan to serve those additional kids. Also, you cannot claim for any meals or snacks that you're not approved to serve, and you can't claim for any months that you said you would be closed. That's why it's important to make sure that the information in your agreement is always current and correct. Also, if you go in to update your agreement, the system also looks at your sanitation and fire inspection dates and will not allow me to approve the agreement if those dates have expired. We have been working around that process due to delays, but please make sure your agreement is updated with any changes. Please know when you make any changes to your agreement, such as you increase the number of kids enrolled, we need to approve that change before you'll be able to file a claim for that change in the system. We can reimburse the district for changes in the month that you report the change and going forward, but we cannot reimburse the districts for changes in the past. Claims must be entered into the system and must be in pending approval status on or before 60 days after the last day of the claim month. For an example, November's claims must be submitted on or before January 29th. The system does display the claim due dates for you, so you'll always know when claims are due. Exceptions. Institutions are only allowed one exception to this rule once every three years. Submission of claims past the 60-day deadline are only allowed with prior approval from the state agency and require that you write a corrective action plan which you will implement to prevent future late claims. Can the CACFP at-risk after-school program continue to operate in summer after schools close for summer vacation? For example, if a school officially ends school year 2023 to 2024 on May 31st, 2024, can the school continue to operate CACFP at risk until June 30th, 2024? The answer is no. Experienced sponsors are already aware that under federal regulations, CACFP and SFSP cannot operate at the same time. Whenever your school year ends, so must CACFP. Schools are encouraged to transition into SFSP during the summer, and CACFP at risk can pick up again when school starts in the fall. Thanks for watching. This is a copy of the non discrimination statement that we are required to post with any CACFP training. Please now go to the website on your screen to complete the CACFP at Risk 101 quiz. This tracks your participation for this annual training. No certificates will be sent out to those watching the recording. Please document your time and attendance after viewing this webinar and keep that documentation in your CACFP files. As a reminder, attending this training does not meet the requirements for in-house training. 
you are required to train your district staff on the seven required training topics. This concludes the CACFT at-risk training. Have a good day.